Lindsay Simpson, welcome to the program. Hi, how are you, Michelle? I'm very good, thank you. A honeymoon Dive, the real story behind the tragic honeymoon death of Tina Watson. Most people will be well aware of this story, but uh, if you could just give us a, a bit of a, a quick uh, rundown of it. Yeah, what actually happened was Tina had been married for 11 days. She came from Alabama, from Birmingham in the States. And she and her husband Gabe came for a scuba diving honeymoon and ended up at the Great Barrier Reef in October 2003. Now, 11 days after the wedding, Tina was dead. And at first it was thought to be a tragic accident. that something had happened underwater, nobody knew what. Um, and for some years, um, there was people uh, basically interviewed about it, but nothing potentially came of it um, until some dogged police work by a couple of detectives and they uncovered a large number of unanswered questions and ended up uh, questioning her husband Gabe Watson about a number of matters and Gabe then gave 16 different versions of the so-called truth around uh, her death because he was the last person who was seen actually with Tina underwater. And he had, had had quite a bit of diving experience already, hadn't he? Yeah, he was a trained rescue diver. He also had his normal uh, his diving certificate and the advanced diving certificate. And then he went on and learned how to rescue people uh, in the ocean. So he was certainly very well qualified, which could have also been why she agreed not to do an orientation dive because for someone of her experience normally the company that she was with would have insisted she did an orientation dive on that first dive over the Ongala where in fact she died. Mm. But because at that stage um, she'd only just uh, achieved a certificate so she'd only done training dives as such hasn't she? Yes I think in total she'd done something like 15 dives all up including her training so she was an absolute novice really mm. and in fact the company ended up getting sued because of that um, you know six or seven thousand dollars but they were the reason the dive instructor went with the fact she didn't need the dive was because her husband was a trained rescue diver so he thought well she's in very good hands there mm. and in fact she actually struggled to get that certificate too didn't she she was one of the most panicked divers, apparently, according to the dive instructor. We actually went to the quarry where she learned how to dive and learned ourselves. We were both novices. Um, at least we did a lesson, let's say. I didn't really learn how to dive, but he took us down to 20 feet and told us exactly where she panicked, what had happened, um, how she... He said to her, look, you shouldn't be doing this, and her words were, if I, you don't understand, if I don't get this dive certificate, my husband will kill me. Mm. I think that's one of the um, the great things about uh, this book, which of course you've co-written with, with Jennifer Cook, is that uh, uh, the, the attention to detail. Yes, actually Capote, Truman Capote, who wrote In Cold Blood, was our absolute mentor. And the other books I've written, Brothers in Arms, about the Bikey Massacre and My Husband, My Killer, and a number of other books are basically on that same technique where you spend a lot of time with people who know you know, rather eyewitnesses or you go and do things like learn how to dive in the same quarry so you can really get inside the characters' heads. Mm, so it's like preparing for a movie role. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. Because when you think about it, they are characters, even though they're real people. They have yeah. to live on the page. So why this particular story? Well, I've been living in Townsville, I had the journalism program up here at James Cook University and... To me, that photograph, they kept running at full page in the Townsville Bulletin, you know, as the inquest then started and the husband, Gabe Watson, was charged with murder. This photograph would come as a full page on the, the local Townsville Bulletin and I kept looking at that photo. I was drawn to the shape of Tina lying on the ocean bed, uh, dying, and I just felt that she was saying, someone's got to tell my story, someone mm -hmm. has got to uncover what went on that day and you know I did think um, I was talking to another journalist who'd actually covered it and spoken to her father and I said it's a great book why don't you write it and she basically said no I'm not interested and I said well if you're not interested then I will. Yeah I have to admit uh, as you get further and further into the book you know I keep looking back at that at that photo and the, the, the front cover of the book and uh, it just 
sends you just get a shiver down your spine when you look at it absolutely it really does have a major impact doesn't it it does it's almost saying to you look help me you know mm. do something and of course that's i mean imagine if we feel that imagine what wade singleton felt he's the fellow who actually went down and rescued her yeah. when her husband abandoned her yeah i mean he didn't even go down to where she was never mind attempt to get her to come up he didn't even go down to her she was just sinking uh, um it was interesting to read that uh, when Gabe Watson was giving his story to, to other divers um, straight after the incident, or when, when she was being pulled out of the water, that uh, n no one believed him right from the start. No, and it's interesting because those two divers were a couple of guys who'd been diving, they're in their 50s, and they're Americans, and they'd been diving for about five or 600 dives between them. And as soon as he came out saying that she was too heavy and she slipped from his grasp, that was one of his many versions of events or versions of the so-called truth, they just said the words B-U-L-L -L, and we better not say the rest on air because um, they didn't believe him from the outset. And I think he was quite crestfallen about that. He really, um, in my view, had perhaps been rehearsing for that moment but he, they didn't buy it at all. They were experienced divers and they said that didn't happen. Yeah, because they're weightless in the water. Absolutely. She weighed 62 kilos. I think he was six foot seven. Yeah. I mean, at what point are you supposed to believe? And the other thing is even the most elementary diving that I've done with uh, Tina's dive instructor, I knew enough to how to inflate your BC, which is your buoyancy compression vest, that you just, you know, press a button, it's full of air and you go to the top. I mean, the most basic instructions I had and I would have known at least what to do. So for him to say he didn't know what to do and he was as qualified as he was is chilling. What about the reason that uh, because it was his wife he panicked? Yes, I mean, that's... The true, but I think the most telling thing of all in this case, and don't forget it's never gone before a jury, the Queensland Director of Public Prosecutions, in my view, have a lot to answer for because after being charged with murder and indicted with murder by them, suddenly the whole story changed. And I think if you go back to the evidence, the most compelling of all evidence for me is the emergency doctor who saw him or I saw a large diver with his arms around her, with his hands behind her back, so he could have been touching her air supply mm. and her tanks. He actually saw that himself. Now, none of the 16 versions that Gabe tells allows for that to happen. In other words, he didn't actually ever say he went near Tina. Yeah. And so what did the doctor see? And who was this large diver? Was his uh, description exactly fitted Gabe, who was lying across her on top of her? And several, we've uncovered in the book, several other people who also saw this other diver. And therefore, even, you know, that that's not explained. Even if he panicked and it was his wife and he rushed up to the top. I mean, he didn't rush. That was the other thing. He mm. took longer to come up than the fellow who went down and saved her and brought her back up. So you've got to start asking questions about you know, what was going on. Yes, and I guess even then he he didn't he, he didn't even want to see his wife at that stage either when they were out of the water. Yes, the awful thing was he told her family that he sat holding her hand as she lay dying and in fact he wasn't even on the boat. So, mm. I mean, he's a consummate liar, that is quite clear. But he, yes, everyone, the other fellows, the two divers I mentioned before who said it was rubbish that he was talking, they said if that was their wife on the other boat, they'd have, you know, even if they'd tried to restrain them, they would have jumped overboard and swam across to where she well, was. That, that, that's right. That's what we all would do if it was a loved one. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, on his way back to Townsville after she died, he didn't even know her body was on board the boat, which makes you think, wouldn't you be saying, where is my husband now? Where is my wife? Hmm. Um, yeah, and he, and sure, it's a bit like a Lindy Chamberlain thing, like a lot of people point to his emotionless state after the event. Um, and that was quite consistent. He even said to her sister at one point, look, I've finished with my grieving. This was like a couple of weeks after she died. You might be going through it, but I'm over it. <laughs> so Jeez. you think, well, what sort of cold-hearted person is this? Yeah. 
Well, I mean, leading up to the uh, the actual uh, wedding, I mean, in the in the time that uh, they had been going out, he was uh, very controlling, wasn't he? Yes, I mean, to say, look, I want to marry, or at least not even say I want to marry you, but actually when she comes home one day, here's the ring on top of the entertainment unit, and she goes over knowing, I mean, it even had the jewellery packaging on it, so, I mean, clearly it was an engagement ring, because mm. she'd been asking, you know, are we going to get married? And the first thing he says is, you look inside there and I'll never marry you. Mm. And he kept that going for four months, so... I mean, a lot of what happened at the inquest, when they look at motives, they didn't really go into the kind of controlling personality he is and the obsession he had with her, which is what her father says as well. Mm. And if you're looking for rational motives in this one, I don't think you're going to find it because, I mean, a psychologist might be able to make more of it than the ordinary person can, but... Certainly, you know, throwing a pizza at her in a restaurant, her, her dog, the, or everyone who was close to her, he absolutely loathed and was obnoxious to, including her dog, who mysteriously died, and he gave her a replacement dog. But, it, you know, it's, it's... And then, of course, digging her up after she died and then going into the grave and cutting all the flowers down that someone had put in the grave, uh, her family, rather, had placed on the grave to remember her by. Mm. And uh, all of that kind of thing, that is really controlling. Yeah, well, it's certainly not normal behaviour. It's not healthy behaviour, is it? It's not healthy behaviour. And mm. I think if he wanted to control her after death, what was he doing when she was alive but controlling her? Yeah. And the ultimate control for somebody, of course, is taking their life. But, but then on the other hand, any, anyone that's controlling and they, they try and take them away from their family, why, why would he kill her or why would he put her in a situation where um, yeah, she, she can die uh, when he's got her alone anyway? Well, I think two weeks before he proposed to her, she made the fatal mistake in my view, which was she went... She was so sick of this business of, you know, I'll bring the ring out when I'm ready. Mm. And basically, two weeks before um, he proposed, she said she decided to go and meet an old school friend to see if there oh, was some right, yeah. love affair mm -hmm. or possibility. Like, she was so sick of him that uh, she did that. And then she made the fatal mistake again of ringing and telling him that she yeah. spent the weekend with this guy. And straight after that, he proposed almost because he realised he'd lost his control over her because she'd gone and done something he didn't want to be done. Mm. And uh, then he decided, well, you know, if she was going to continue living, there was always that possibility she might run off with someone else. Now, I, I understand that uh, Tina's parents are not particularly happy with the justice system in Australia and, and, and uh, apparently uh, Gabe Watson's parents aren't either. But uh, but even uh, uh, those in the in that profession in America are a bit dismayed by it as well. Well, I mean the tragedy of the whole thing is that we're playing the whole uh, we're playing the uh, deciding the, or the judge ourselves. We're not allowing them to get their hands on the the exhibits and the evidence, mm. even though we've already dealt with them here. There's nothing more we can do here with the judicial system. He's already had an appeal. He's had his sentence extended. We've finished with him in a legal sense. So mm -hmm. why we're not handing over these absolutely... I mean, they can't go before a grand jury, what they call in the US a grand jury, which is like our committal hearing here. They can't do that without these exhibits. So they can't prosecute him. And we're saying, well, we'll only give it to you if you don't give him the death penalty if he is found guilty. Now, is it our call to say that? Well, under our extradition treaty... We are not allowed to send people to a country where they might die, and that's to cover refugees, you know, someone being shot by the firing squad because they come from the, a, a country that's got problems, mm -hmm. not to basically protect someone who's been charged with his wife's murder. And that's being used by us as a humanitarian reason for not um, basically cooperating with the American authorities. And understandably, they're getting really, really annoyed because... He gets out in the middle of November and they have a limited amount of time by which to collect the evidence to put this before a grand jury. Without the evidence, they can't do anything. What was he eventually convicted of here in Australia? 
He was convicted of manslaughter under Section 290 of the Crimes Act, which is basically one of those uh, laws that if you have a child and you starve it to death and don't give it food, you've caused the child's death by omitting something like nourishment. Mm -hmm. So that by not giving her air and not helping her when she just clearly needed help, um, he caused her death. So it is, it is a criminal offence under the Crimes Act, but it certainly basically says he was just a bad a dive buddy. Mm. It doesn't it say anything like the charge he was given by the coroner, which said he would, should be charged with murder. And the point is that no jury has ever sat on this case and decided what the facts were. And the DPP, if they'd put a trial on, you see, it was going to cost them half of their budget. So uh, what Tommy has said, her father has said, is this was a financial decision. It had nothing to do with justice, which is really sobering yeah. thought. Yes, it is, isn't it? What do you think will happen when he goes back to the States? Well, they're hoping to get him on a couple of different charges, which is conspiring to murder. I'm not sure exactly what's behind that. They're being very closely guarding what they're up to. but And the other is a kid kidnapping charge, in other words, taking her over here knowing that he was actually going to kill her. That's what they're alleging. Mm. But um, if it depends, I mean, if he doesn't go back to Alabama, like when he gets out of jail, is he going to be escorted back there? If they don't have the exhibits to basically put the case together, are they going to be able to um, a call for his arrest or are they going? is he just going to walk free out of uh, the Brisbane jail that he's in? and get on with his new life, which includes a new wife who looks remarkably like Tina. It must be absolutely heart-wrenching for, for the parents. I mean, on, on both sides, really, because Gabe's parents seem to be convinced that uh, their son is innocent. Well, the sad thing about Gabe's parents, in my view, is that they, when they do make statements about the case, there's a lot of inaccuracies about what they're saying. Like, they're saying that the person who was giving her the bear hug, which is known as the bear hug, which um, the emergency doctor later identified as being a very large man. In other words, they're confusing that with one Wade Singleton who rescued her from the bottom, who was quite a small man. Right. Plus, he rescued her from the bottom, whereas what the emergency doctor saw was halfway down before she sunk mm. to the bottom. So they're saying things like, oh, they've just got it all confused and that was the guy who was rescuing her, when clearly that's not what the evidence says at all, no matter what you believe. So, so they're, they're really... In, uh, I mean, I mean, it, from from what I've, I've read about their comments, they really do believe it. So they're, they're in denial, aren't they? Yes, which you imagine, I suppose, if your son is accused of murdering or charged with murdering someone, you mm. are going to basically rush to his son. I wrote another book, My Husband, My Killer, about Andrew Kalasich, the Manly Hotel owner, and he had a, hired a hitman to kill his wife. He gets out of jail next year. And uh, his his children were on the 7.30 report with me when the book came out, and they were absolutely adamant that Dad hadn't done it. And yet Dad had actually organised for Mum to be driven off a cliff while his son was in the back of the car when he was only seven so even mm. though the evidence pointed absolutely against Andrew Kalasic the family still believe as far as I know to this day that he's innocent mm. which you can sympathize with um, and the thing is to understand that Gabe Watson has not been found guilty of murder uh, but he's certainly been charged with murder and mm. he certainly um, was indicted for murder so the questions are more than just suspicions. It's gone beyond that. And mm. anyone who gives 16 different versions of the truth, you'd have to be questioning what they believe. Yes, yes, that's right. You, you've clearly done a, an enormous amount of work for this book. It, it's, it's a great read. Of course. But particularly because you put all the scenes together and then the dialogue, and it just gives you that, that much more depth, I guess, to the story. Um, yes, it's interesting because my co-author believes that he, there is not enough evidence um, to, against him. So we did have a few fights. She's in America. She, we fight over Skype. We're very old friends. Yeah. And we're both reporters. But I guess um, her view is that it's circumstantial evidence that's against him. But I suppose my bottom line is it's not so much is he guilty or innocent. It's why hasn't a jury been asked to sit in on the case and listen to all the evidence and decide themselves, like a, the normal justice system, whether this man is guilty or not guilty. That's what the role, that's what how we set up the judiciary or the 
the justice system to do. Yes, and if uh, people come over here as, as tourists and then, and then things like that happen, it doesn't put us in a very good light, does it? No, I think the way we played it out by holding on to exhibits and playing this sort of very dominating role mm. over, you know, if another country wants to pursue a charge against someone, is it our right to say, well, we don't believe in what you're doing and we're not going to give you the evidence? Yeah. Lindsay, thanks very much for your time. Congratulations on the book. Oh, thanks, Michelle. See what happens with uh, Gabe in the future. Absolutely. It's a continuing saga.